Hello. I would like to welcome everyone to today's Systems for Action Research in Progress webinar. Our theme focuses on strategies to achieve alignment, collaboration, and synergy across delivery and financing systems. And the title of our presentation is Financing Integrated Health and Social Services for Populations with Mental Illness. I'd like to go ahead and present our agenda for today's webinar. My name is Shauna Moore, and I am the Director of Dissemination and Research Development for the Robert Wood Johnson Systems for Action National Program Office. We will start with the introduction, then have our presentation and commentary, and end with discussion and questions. If you have a question or comment, please feel free to type it into the chat box in the lower left-hand portion of your screen at any time throughout the presentation. Questions and comments will be addressed at the end. I would like to go ahead and introduce our presenters. Dr. Yewa Bao is a health economist specializing in payment and performance evaluation policies to align incentives with evidence-based mental health care. She is leading an NIMH R01 to assess the role of value-based payment as a strategy to enhance fidelity and patient outcomes of collaborative depression care. Dr. Lisa Dixon specializes in developing and implementing multifaceted interventions to improve the quality of mental health care for individuals with serious mental illnesses such as schizophrenia. Dr. Dixon directs On Track NY, the New York State implementation of early in interventions for psychosis, and oversees On Track USA, a national initiative to provide training and technical assistance to states implementing early inventions. And our commentary speaker, Dr. Thomas Smith, is an Associate Medical Director at the New York State Office of Mental Health and a Medical Director at the New York State Office of Mental Health Division of Managed Care, a special lecturer in the Department of Psychiatry at Columbia University. Dr. Smith has directed behavioral health programs for individuals with serious mental illness in both community and academic settings for over 25 years and has conducted extensive research on the factors that predict recovery from chronic illnesses in this population. And now I would like to go ahead and hand the program over to Dr. Bao. Great. Thanks for the very kind introduction, uh, Shana. Uh, and I'm just going to uh, share my screen uh, right now. And if you guys could tell me uh, if everybody can see my screen. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, we're ready to go. So uh, thanks again. And uh, I wanted to start by uh, acknowledging our research team. And this is probably the most interdisciplinary team I ever worked with. Um, so it goes without saying that this project is not possible without you know, any of them. Uh -huh. And uh, Dr. I, I think I can skip myself and uh, Dr. Lisa Dixon uh, because of the kind of introduction that was just made. Dr. Humansky is a health economist at New York State Psychiatric Institute and Columbia University. She led the analysis of one source of data that contributed to our tool development. Dr. Radigan uh, is the Director of Performance Measurement and Evaluation at New York State Office of Mental Health, um, who very kindly facilitated our access to data for this project. Dr. Yan Li is a systems engineer and health services researcher at uh, New York Academy of Medicine and Mount Sinai Medical School. Um, uh, he's doing the weight lift at this point <laughs> of uh, implementing our, uh, you know, analytical algorithms into an interactive tool. Uh, Dr. Anker is a faculty member and associate professor in uh, our, my own department in health informatics, um, who leads the user tests uh, of the tool to make sure that it, it actually works. Um, Yui John is getting uh, her uh, MS degree in health. In Health Informatics at Cornell, and she is working uh, with Dr. Anker and me um, to conduct, in the, conduct user tests, but also help uh, tremendously with uh, the development of the prototype. Um, Philip Jen is a research coordinator uh, in my department at Cornell um, who provides essential research support uh, to the project. And including IRB and, and also conducts analysis uh, of data to support the project. 
so uh, thank you all for uh, your great, great teamwork and contribution. Um, so let's uh, move on, and I wanted to provide a brief outline of the presentation. Um, so we want to touch very briefly on the background, um, and and then go over with you a conceptual model to pay for early interventions for psychosis. I wanted to say a little bit about the progress we made so far. And I wanted to reserve time uh, in the end to show you a, the prototype that we've already developed uh, of the payment tool. Uh, I think we have reached consensus within our research team that there's basically no substitution for showing uh, you know, the audience the, the actual tool or the prototype of it to get a sense of how it works. So uh, schizophrenia and other psychosis are among the most serious and disabling mental health conditions. Um, the peak onset of these conditions is usually between 15 and 25 years old. Um, a uni unique thing about these conditions is it can be years uh, before a formal diagnosis could be made. Uh, so onset of conditions usually derails an individual, uh, leading to disruption in school or employment. Um, if recognition is not specifically addressed, uh, these conditions can lead to lifelong disability. And prior to 2005, many countries uh, around the world started developing early interventions for psychosis, but not the U.S., uh, not much in the U.S., uh, except a, a couple of uh, states. And one of the reasons that the U.S. lacked the other countries is because of policy environment. And, and we know that community mental health centers are the primary providers of mental health care to people with serious and persistent mental health conditions. Uh, so they, they focus on individuals with chronic mental illness, and existing disability. And uh, also, uh, we know that disability is you know, one of the few eligibility uh, you know, criteria for being eligible for Medicaid and other public services uh, prior to the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and this made early intervention less possible. However, at the same time, there is emerging ident identification of evidence-based practices for early interventions. Um, this uh, eventually led to the you know, NIMH, uh, National Institute of Mental Health, to develop a research program uh, for early interventions. And, and they later on sponsored two studies uh, that are collectively known as RAISE. And in fact, Dr. Dixon is uh, the PI, is the principal investor of, of one of the RAISE uh, studies. And the RAISE studies, and other accumulating uh, evidence uh, and then contributed to this evidence base known as Coordinated Specialty Care, or CSC. CSC really changed the paradigm of treating early psychosis. It follows the principles of recovery orientation, uh, shared decision making, a team of specialists that include both clinicians and non-clinicians, and also, it has this distinct objective of minimizing duration of untreated psychosis. And consistent with these principles, uh, here are the key service elements. And I highlighted a few that are uh, basically not, you know, go far beyond the traditional uh, clinical services that you would expect to receive uh, for these conditions. Um, so for the for example, a very distinct component of CSC is supported employment or education. Uh, this is to uh, specifically address the recovery needs of, of these individuals. And each CSC team actually uh, w has a designated person, a designated specialist, whose role is to support clients with, OK, uh, finding, you know, seeking, finding, and keeping a job or to stay in school. And uh, also consistent with these uh, principles are the, you know, the, the core service processes that I listed here. Uh, as you can see here, that many of these uh, services do not have existing payment uh, mechanisms. Hi, Dr. Bell. I'm so, sorry to interrupt. Can you make your slides full screen? We've had a few uh, notes come in. Oh. Uh, 
oh, I am, I am on screen, but maybe I should share the other monitor. There we go. That's perfect. Okay. Sorry about that. Thank you um, so much. So, uh, okay. Um, wanted to make sure that we are on the right slide. Okay. All right. So I'm showing you a few uh, milestones that that happened in the past decade that really accelerated adoption of evidence-based care for early psychosis. And I highlighted a few that that are uh, very, you know, are, are congruent with, you know, financing this innovative model of care. Um, so basically, in in 2014, there are two congressional bills that uh, were passed to uh, allocate five percent of mental health block grants to uh, implementation of early psychosis interventions. And that amounted to $25 million nationwide. And later on in 2015, Congress again kind of raised the earmarked funding to $50 million, which is double the previous uh, budget, uh, as set aside for early intervention uh, implementation. And as you can see on the right-hand side, that these earmarked funding really boosted uh, state you know, adoption of these uh, early intervention models. Uh, so from 2014 to 2016, there was really a very dramatic uh, increase in number of states with early intervention plans, uh, and, and it continued to increase after 2016. So by now, uh, almost every state, I would suppose it's 46, 47 states now, um, have such a plan, at least. Um, so among those states was New York State. Um, so New York State's uh, statewide implementation of early intervention is called On Track New York. And so far, there are about 22 teams uh, around New York State that are you know, providing CSC services, uh, even though, as you can see here, that these teams are kind of concentrated in population centers. Even though New York State is leading the country in um, kind of implementing early interventions, uh, we can still see here that there's a still, you know, big chunks of the states that uh, where, especially in those rural and areas uh, in less population, less uh, populated areas, that people still don't have easy access to CSC. Um, like many innovative programs that integrate health and you know, social services, financing uh, these programs can be a big barrier uh, to implementation and, and uh, dissemination. And this is the case here uh, for early interventions for psychosis. Um, mental health block grant uh, you know, provides a stimulus uh, to implementation, but it is seriously inadequate for population-wide deployment. And currently, CSC teams typically take a patchwork approach uh, to financing. Uh, so they get resources from the block grant funding. They might do insurance billing, uh, often not consistently. And uh, they receive some funding from grants. And a lot of them also receive institutional supplements. Um, so scaling up and sustaining CSC really calls for a payment system that Number one, adequately covers the cost of evidence-based evidence care. Number two, it needs to align incentives with patient-centered and recovery-oriented care, which is very uh, quintessential of CSC. And also, because CSC practices uh, differ a lot uh, among different um, you know, states and localities, really a, a good payment system needs to be tailored to local preferences and practices. Um, so I wanted to spend a couple of minutes on a conceptual model for a multi-part payment system, which was first proposed by Frank Lee de McGuire in 2014. And uh, so they proposed uh, several parts of a payment system. And the part one is a per case payment or a case rate payment, also known, you know, you, you would hear uh, sometimes being called a bundled payment. 
Um, so this component is supposed to cover team lead leadership, community outreach, case management, supported employment and education. So basically services that do not have uh, existing kind of, uh, you know, uh, payments mechanism and, and yield matched to the fee-for-service uh, way of paying for services. And uh, the second part is a per-service payment. Uh, it covers pharmacotherapy, psychotherapy, family, psychoeducation, basically services that are often visit-based and do have current uh, you know, uh, payment mechanisms. I put a question mark uh, after SEE here because in some you know, jurisdictions or you know, states, they actually do have a pay kind of per-service type uh, payment mechanism for SEE, which then really, you know, then SEE would fit here. Uh, so this also speaks to the need to tailor the payment design to uh, different uh, local needs. And the third part is an outcome-based payment, uh, which really provides explicit incentive for um, outcome-based, uh, for, for achieving desired outcomes of the program. So it rewards providers for achieving predefined targets. So this conceptual model really kind of at the very beginning inspired our work. When we, uh, and, and also made us start to think, you know, how will a payer or administrator operationalize this model, which, is, which was largely conceptual at that time. And, but also, uh, if they were to adopt the system, how much should the payment rate be, you know, especially the per case payment. And also, as a, from a payer's perspective, they probably wanted to know how much they expect to pay, say, over three months, uh, you know, for budget and, you know, planning purposes. Um, so this really led to our uh, S4A uh, developmental project. Uh, thank you again for, to uh, uh, RWGA and the uh, System for Action program um, for funding our study. So we have two aims. Um, the first is to develop analytical algorithms uh, of an innovative, innovative multi-part payment system for CSC. And the second aim is to use the, to implement the analytical algorithms into uh, a uh, decision support tool. So we wanted to develop and a pilot test of this DST that would enable CSC payers to tailor payment design to local needs and circumstances. And we used <clears throat> two unique sources of data from OnTrack New York, uh, so New York's uh, implementation of early, early interventions. So the first source is the OnTrack New York Medicaid time study, uh, which was conducted in June of 2017 and provided very detailed documentation of services uh, and you know, staff time on these services over a two-week window for 73 randomly selected Medicaid clients. Um, and, <clears throat> and also we have credential of the service provider in each case. <clears throat> so this set of data really um, allowed us to derive, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> to derive relative resource use among different types of services, and but also clients of different acuity. And that this in turn informs uh, analytical algorithms of case rate and per service payment designs. And the other, uh, the other source of data comes from the OnTrack New York client assessment, which is done every three months for each client. <clears throat> and this helps inform the outcome-based payment design, uh, which basically allows us to <clears throat> derive a uh, benchmark uh, for uh, each, uh, you know, uh, client, each type of client outcomes. And here I'm showing you a chart that shows um, results from a, an analysis of <clears throat> data from 325 individuals uh, of clients in OnTrack New York. And as you can see here that uh, over time, um, you know, there's a steady increase in the rate of these clients being engaged in education and employment, uh, as indicated by the red line, 
and indicating indicated by the the blue line is a very dramatic decrease in the hospitalization rate from baseline to three months, um, but also you know a very stable uh, hospital hospitalization rate uh, throughout the first year. Um, so briefly about our project progress, <clears throat> I've told you about so far, and uh, currently we are. <clears throat> implementing the prototype into an uh, interactive tool led by Dr. Lee. And we are also, at the same time, we are developing user testing protocol and interview guide uh, led by Dr. Anker and uh, Yingwei Zhang. And uh, at the same time, we are also recruiting test users for the better, for the better version of the tool. And I think one selfish um, objective of this RIP, of our doing the RIP seminar is uh, that we ask you know, anyone at, in the audience, if you have in mind someone who could be a good test user for the tool, <clears throat> we would really appreciate it if you could you know, get into touch with us. Um, and uh, so in the next few months, we are to um, conduct a target of 10 uh, user tests uh, with the tool. And we will uh, analyze the interview data from the user tests. And then we will refine the payment tool based on findings <coughs> of the user tests. Um, so in the next, I hope, you know, five, six minutes, uh, uh, I wanted to go through this payment prototype uh, with you um, to give you a sense of how, you know, what the, the tool would look like and, and, and uh, how it might work. So let me just uh, click on that online link and hopefully leads to uh, yeah, I need to exit. <clears throat> so can everybody see my screen, uh, which is should be an online yes. browser window? CSE payment tool? Okay. Um, so we start by, so this is the start of our tool, uh, which is supposed to be an interactive. Uh, this is a prototype at this point. Uh, it's not perfectly interactive, but, you know, for demonstration purposes, it should work well. Um, so we start by, you know, telling the user a bit about what the tool is for. And then once they click next, the next page um, lists the information that they will need to use the tool to tailor the payment design. And uh, once we remind them to collect these information before they start, and then if they are ready and click start, um, we present a screen, a, a kind of a glossary screen uh, about the, you know, kind of give the definitions of a few very uh, key terms that we use in the tool. And of note are the four buckets of uh, services that, that, you know, they will later on encounter in the tool. So we kind of put all CSC services into uh, the four buckets, which are clinical, community-based, case management, and administrative. And once they click Next, we bring them to the next screen where we provide an overview of the payment system, which is similar to what I showed you early on, earlier uh, in, the, in the presentation. And we also pointed out that the uh, part one is a must-have component. Uh, part two and part three are optional. So now they're at a first design page for the case rate payment. And we asked them to first select the types of services they wanted to cover with the case rate payment. And uh, so, for example, this user selected three uh, types of services to be covered under the case rate payment. And then in the next screen, uh, we confirmed their selection. And then because they selected clinical services, and our data, our analyses indicate that um, 
the resource intensity of clinical services really mattered a lot, you know, varied a lot, as, you know, depending on the acuity of the clients, uh, meaning that, you know, clients in their uh, acute phase use a whole lot more uh, clinical services than uh, clients in, um, you know, on ongoing clients. So we, given that they included clinical services in the case rate payment, we offer an option for them to consider a fixed rate payment versus a variable case rate payment. Um, so if they consider, if they indicate, okay, I wanted to consider a variable ca uh, case rate payment, then they move on to the next page where we asked about the setup of their team, of their local CSE team, and some information about the costs of running that team because we, these, are, these are needed to kind of uh, come up with a case rate payment rate. Um, so we, but we realized that there, there are chances that are that the users may not have the detailed information. And we offer an option of using the default set of information based on New York State experience uh, but also basing the uh, default wage rates on national average. So if they say, okay, I would like to use uh, the uh, default information, then they move on to the next screen, uh, which we show the default setup of the team and the FTE and the wage rate. And in, on this screen, we ask more questions about uh, the fringe rate, the indirect cost rate, and the expected caseload. Uh, so uh, they make their choices about, you know, they select the one that's closest to their local experience, and they move on. Um, and then we move into uh, the second part of the payment system, uh, the per service payment, which is an optional component. And depending on, you know, given the services that they chose to cover under the case rate payment, uh, Commute, you know, as a result, the following services will be covered on a per-service basis. And we ask them, okay, would you like to see an estimate of the potential revenue uh, from the per-service payment that the CSC team will potentially receive? And they say yes, uh, so we move on. And now we come into the third part of uh, the payment system, which is outcome-based. Uh, again, this is in an optional component, and we ask them to say, okay, do you know, to indicate whether they wanted to consider this component. And if they say yes, we move on to the design of the outcome-based payment. And uh, so, so the first choice they can make for the outcome-based payment is what outcomes, what client outcomes uh, they wanted to incentivize explicitly. Uh, so for example, in this case, the user selected, uh, you know, psychiatric hospital hospitalization, meaning that reduction in psychiatric hospitalization as an outcome. And they also select, uh, you know, 10% to, chose to devote 10% of their total budget to this incentive payment. And by now, they've completed all sections, and they can click Finish um, to come to a summary page of their payment design. And obviously, uh, you, see, you see the edit bu buttons for the case rate payment and outcome-based payment. Uh, which they could, users could use to go back to the design page to revise their design. And if, once they're all done, they come back to this page and they can click the button to generate a report. And here is uh, the report uh, for uh, the design, uh, well, the, the payment rate for the case repayment and the estimated total payment over three months period uh, for, a tip, uh, for a typical CSE team in their locality and uh, estimated you know, per service total per service payment for uh, this caseload of uh, patients, uh, clients, and a expected payout for outcome-based payment. And there's a save button at the bottom to, to allow them to save this scenario and their uh, payouts uh, and so that they could compare it to alternative scenarios that they uh, would design with the same tool. Um, so let me now come back to uh, the presentation, and I think I should just uh, not share my screen at this point. 
Is it now back to you? Yeah. Yes. Great. So I think, Shana, you're in control now, right? Okay. Yes, I am. Thank you very much uh, for that great presentation. Um, and yeah. now we are going to, uh, yeah, and now we are going to switch over to the commentary from Dr. Smith. Dr. Smith, are you on the line? Yes, I'm on the line. Can you hear me? Yes, great. Um, you know, I had some problems logging in earlier, so I, I, um, I'm, I'm just joining in the past couple of minutes. Are you looking for me to present the data online or just to say a couple words in general? I think it would be great just to have a couple words in general in response. Yeah. yeah. Well, I can say, you know, we've worked with, with uh, Dr. Bao for the past uh, well over a year now on this, and it's, it's been very informative both ways. I think the data we had in New York were uh, helpful to you in developing the tool, but I, I also think it's worked the other way. You know, you as advice and participation with us um, has been very, very critical. In New York, um, you know, we've got uh, over 20 different uh, uh, CSC or, or clinic sites that are serving the individuals with first episode psychosis, and, and there's a significant amount of subsidies uh, going towards getting these new programs up and running from block grant dollars and state grant dollars. But the big challenge for us over time is to get these, these programs to be uh, self-sufficient and to be able to bill and, and uh, uh, capture revenues that can allow them to be sustained over time. So it's been, in many ways, one of our bigger worries uh, here in New York. So I think a tool like this is going to be very, very helpful to uh, either payers, whether it's a, a state level, uh, oversight entity or managed care plans, and also to providers, too, who uh, really need to drill down and understand what are the services you're providing, what are the, the resources you need, what kind of staffing patterns do you need, and how does it all add up, uh, whether it's a, a specific case rate or not, what are, what are your costs and projected uh, revenues. So I think the tool is going to be very, very uh, important. Uh, in New York, we are finding that there's a real interesting mix of services being provided uh, to these uh, these patients from you know traditional uh, core billable services like therapy, medication management, uh, to some of the newer recovery-oriented services like the employment supports, education supports that that Yua was talking about. Uh, we are seeing our teams providing a significant amount of those services, which is good. We want that. Um, the teams in New York are doing a lot of care management and case management. It, it's a team-based model that aims to really engage support systems like families, for example. So there's a lot of coordination amongst providers, a lot of case management, even community-based case management. So in some of our initial time study analyses, there's you know, upwards of 20 to 25 percent of the time is providing those kinds of activities. So again, teasing out these different activities and having a good sense of what, what can be collected by revenues, uh, what gaps are there, and how those gaps might be filled, whether it's through incentive payments or case rates. You know, these are exactly the kinds of questions we're wrestling with here in New York. And, and again, Dr. Bao's work and the tool, I think, are going to be a real, uh, real advantage for us. Okay, great. Yeah. That was great commentary. Um, I just I wanted to respond to that while we wait for some questions to come in, and I want to encourage those listening to uh, put their questions in the chat box in the lower left-hand portion of your screen because we can filter those. Um, Dr. Bao, I like that you mentioned that there was a save button uh, in the in the tool where you can actually save the data um, and compare it to alternative scenarios. And I wondered if you could talk about the use for that data going forward. Um, I think that's really unique, and if you've already thought into the future um, about how you might be able to apply that to maybe adjust the way you provide services with that additional information. Dr. Bao, are you still on the line? 
sorry, I'm, I'm muted myself. Um, and oh, no problem. You can hear me now. <laughs> yes, uh -huh. you're with um, So your question was about the the save uh, function of our tool. Right, and utilizing the data that you get from that going forward, if you have any ideas on how that may alter providing services in the future, because that's going to provide, you said you can do in a comparative oh. analysis or maybe a scenario-based analysis with that data. And I thought that seemed really interesting that you built that in and you had thought into the future about um, using that. That sounds almost like another branch off study, maybe, the data that you could get from this tool going forward. Oh, that's a that's a very interesting idea. We actually haven't thought about that, and I think you were referring to the potential down the road of using uh, this tool as some kind of intervention, uh, um, you know, in 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 seeing how the tool might or or different or alternative payment designs might change uh, service provision. Is that what you were getting at? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. We weren't. We. We. Uh, obviously, this is uh, beyond the the scope of our uh, pilot project. And uh, but that's you know if there is a you know the the you know, if it's feasible to kind of test out our tool uh, in a in a real world implementation uh, context that that be that be you know very intriguing I, I guess. Yeah. I but but the really immediate yeah I guess the immediate uh, purpose that we had in mind was uh, because uh, when a, a a user starts using this tool uh, they might now have made up their mind about you know you know whether you know do I put this type of service in under case rate versus fee for service or uh, what sorts of uh, you know outcomes that we wanted to uh, incentivize right so they might mm -hmm. be uh, un undecided about these design choices uh, and and also in some cases like uh, the setup of the CSC team uh, as you can you know as I mentioned uh, currently there's a lot of variation as also uh, you know dr. Smith mentioned uh, even within New York State uh, different teams are doing it differently um, so, uh, so there might be a need to compare payment implications uh, for these different design choices, but also uh, different setup of of the CSC teams. Uh, you know, for example, for a given role on the team, you might be able to uh, use different, uh, you know, personnel of different credentials. Um, so that's kind of an immediate uh, function or purpose of allowing uh, the users to save different scenarios of their payment design and compare. Yes, absolutely. I think that is really interesting. I actually had a note down here um, about maybe adjusting the tool, which you just kind of touched on. So I think that is really interesting. Is this tool easily adjusted for your needs? Um, yeah, uh, we are trying to build it in a way that's flexible uh, and uh, could respond to local needs uh, as you right. can see that you know from the choices that we we offer uh, and the information that we ask uh, from the users um, but it's uh, I'm not sure if uh, Yen uh, he might have because he's he's the kind of the engineer who's gonna um, Make it fly, and so I don't know if uh, Yan, do you have any uh, input at this point uh, to respond to that question? All right. Well, I've got some notes here about um, adjustment on the tool. I think that is really interesting. The um, tool, actually, it sounds like can be implemented in multiple markets. Do you find that it, it might be useful in different sectors? I'm sorry, is there someone else on the line? Okay, it may have just been feedback. Um, so I was I made some notes on adoption and training of the tool. Uh, can you talk about the training that you guys have? I know it, this is in the beta version, correct? So um, training implications going forward for use of this? with uh, practitioners? Uh, 
um, yeah, we're we're still in the very early stage of developing the tool, and uh, you know that's why our next the focus of our next stage is really to bring the beta version to potential users and uh, seek their feedback on you know does this make sense or is it easy to yeah. use or is does it really meet my you know the the pressing needs that I face now. Uh, so uh, it should. I'm, I'm not sure if uh, Jessica, you wanted to uh, jump in and provide some some thoughts on this. Uh, I think the goal is really to make the tool as easy uh, to use as possible, and it shouldn't take some train. I mean, it's the goal of a, a good health informatics tool to. Uh, to 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 make it straightforward and easy and user friendly uh, uh, of high usability, so to speak. Um, so I we don't we do not if it requires some training to do. Uh, I'm not sure if it's a successful tool <laughs> in that sense. Uh, but I don't know if uh, Jessica, if you wanted to uh, jump in at this point. And can uh, uh, Shana can. And Kara, can they uh, actually chime in at this point? Um, not or unless they're in as a speaker on the line. So if okay. they're an attendee, they won't be able to speak. So I'm not sure if they are. But Jessica is typing in. Actually, Jessica, if you can hear me, we can see your responses. I can um, in the lower left-hand portion if you wanted to type a sentence or two in response. Uh, you are muted because you're considered a participant. So. Um, that's why your microphone is silent. So I'm sorry about that. So she's typing. She just said sure. Um, let's see. We're looking for a response if, if on the, she, the training part. If she uses the speaker, um, okay. She online. said she does think it's possible. Um, she just said, I do think it's possible that at some point we could develop training programs using this tool, which is great. That's that's what I was thinking for, that this could maybe be part of a kit. Um, and that there's that when you build a tool like this, there's just um, a starting point, it seems like, of where you can go with, with something like this. So um, I find it really fascinating. I have actually, I've got several notes on my page that looks like an algorithm. <laughs> so... Um, that is great. Um, she said, for example, new staff could learn how to develop programs. So thank you, Jessica, for your response to that question. Uh, if anybody else has any questions, we still have uh, some time left. And it uh, looks like, Jessica, do you have any words that you'd like to speak? The, the chairperson is able to unmute your phone now. Okay, Jessica is going to speak, Dr. Bao. We're just going to unmute her line. She was able to get to her. Yep. I just need, this is Kara, Shauna. I need her actual phone number to know um, the, which one to be able to unmute. So hopefully, uh, I think they're all open. She's on computer audio. That could present an issue with the computer audio with the microphone with the microphone issue. So, um, okay. computer audio with no no connected microphone will give will not be allowed to to work. So, apologize about that. Okay. Well, while we wait for that to come in, if anybody else has any other questions, or Dr. Bao, if you have anything else you'd like to uh, discuss with the tool, maybe any. Um, issues that you've seen going forward? I know you're in the early stages, so it's hard to ask about stuff as, as you're currently utilizing it. Have you have you done anything outside of the office um, with the tool so far? Uh, not really. As, as I indicated that uh, we are, we just developed the product type and uh, we are bringing it to potential users. Uh, but you know, one thing that I wanted to share at this point is, uh, which is also something that we 
struggled with, <laughs> which is uh, whether or not this tool can actually also be repurposed um, to be used by provider teams. Um, okay. The, you know, right now, I mean, we started out by uh, anticipating the need to design a, a payment system for these kind of team-based services um, that's from a payer's perspective. Uh, but as we move along, I, we kind of realize that there might also be a need from the provider's perspective um, to assess you know, adequacy of uh, current payment, payment uh, you know, mechanisms and uh, you know, kind of revenue and you know, implications of providing the services uh, given the current kind of revenue sources. So uh, that's something we, uh, I, I hope that uh, our, um, you know, user tests would also kind of uh, provide some, in, you know, inform in that regard. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I'm not sure if, uh, Tom, uh, you know, you might wish to, uh, to chime in on that point. I would just agree with you. That's our next step is to start piloting it with the users around the state. We're going to identify a group and and see how it works. All right, well that's great. We actually did have a question come in that's right along this line. Um, Kyle would like to know, is the tool designed for an integrated health system with IP and ambul ambulatory care, or is it primarily for primary care clinics? Oh, this is, uh, that's a very good question. Um, so I guess it gets to, you know, at this point, uh, we are focusing on, uh, you know, coordinate specialty care (CSC), uh, which is early interventions for psychosis. Um, and these services are being offered, uh, provided uh, primarily at community mental health centers at this point. Uh, and some of, you know, some of the teams in New York State are doing it at, a, you know, based at a hospital. Um, so. Uh, they're not primary care based, um, and then um, and it's mostly outpatient uh, and community based. Um, but I think it, the question really speaks to the uh, I guess the potential of the tool to be generalized, generalized, or the idea of doing this tool. Uh, uh, is generalizable to many other interventions that are team-based and uh, are integrated, uh, in, you know, integrating both clinical and social services, both within clinical settings and in communities. So I, I think, uh, you know, that's why we're really glad to have this, uh, we start with this de developmental project, but we hope that the, this idea and this this way of designing a DST could be transferable to many other settings and interventions. All right. Yes, that is a great question. That is a great question. All right, Kyle, so thank you so much. And it looks like Jessica is still trying to dial in. So um, I Jessica, think I'm on are now. You with us? Great. Can you hear me? All right, welcome, Jessica. Do you want to go back I'm and so sorry. to uh, the training? <laughs> No, it's great to have you. <laughs> um, so yes, I could just you know echo what Yuhua was saying, which is that this particular development is for a particular situation, but there are a number of different directions that this could go and different ways this could be adapted. And um, I'll also echo what she said, which is that we would we would love to. Um, invite some people with some knowledge of this process to serve as our beta testers. And uh, if you're interested, uh, you know, please contact us, or if you do have contact who might be interested, um, and we can set up a time that's convenient and walk through it and interview you and um, get some feedback on how this could be made more uh, helpful and relevant to your work. Great. Okay, so they can reach out to, your, uh, to you all if they're looking to participate. I would encourage anyone to reach out to uh, the PI or the co-PI, so Dr. Bao and Dixon. Um, is that correct, if they would like to participate? 
Yes, it looks like Yuha has got her uh, email address up there on the screen right now. Uh, yep. So that would be a great first point Perfect. of contact. Okay. Well, that is uh, a great suggestion. And I want to thank you all for such a great presentation. As you see the questions, <laughs> once you start really thinking about this, they really, they really can stretch across so many different uh, disciplines and different clinic avenues. So um, thank you so much for your work on this project so far. I wanted to say thank you to everyone who is listening with us today. Uh, it looks like that is going to round out our question and commentary uh, part of this webinar. I would like to go ahead and direct you to our systemsforaction.org website where you can see a list of our upcoming webinars. Uh, our next webinar for you to attend with us online is July 11th at 12 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, please go to the website at systemsforaction.org to register at your convenience. Uh, it looks like we're just about out of time, so I'd like to go ahead and just put up our acknowledgment page on our funding. Uh, Systems for Action is a national program office of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and a collaborative effort of the College of Public Health Systems and Services Research and the College of Public Health and the Center for Poverty Research and the Gatton College of Business and Economics administered by the University of Kentucky here in Lexington. We want to thank everyone for attending this webinar today. Uh, it looks like we're ending just a little bit early. A uh, special thank you to our presenters, and I look forward to uh, being online with you all in the future. I'd like to wish everybody a good day, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and say goodbye. Thank you.